Oh, I ended up accidentally using both these forks. I just realized. That's okay. a watermelon. I was just using my hands. Oh, okay. Do you want one of these forks that I used? Or do you like a fresh fork? Um, as long as you don't care that I'm using my hands. Like, I'm oh, not going to touch them yeah. all. Go ahead. This is Red Wagner, and you're listening to the Marxism Today podcast. I'm joined by Tony. Hello. And today, we are going to talk about commodity fetishism and, and possibly some other topics. I don't know if we want to introduce them right now. Well, I'm hoping that we can work our way to one of my favorite Marx quotes. Um, and what would that be? Oh, I don't know if I should. I start with that quote. It doesn't matter. We'll we'll save it. That's a teaser okay. for everyone listening. Exactly. There, Otherwise, I can there's a, one of Tony's favorite quotes later in this episode, maybe. Yeah, or on a completely different episode about it, depending on how things go. Yes. So, commodity fetishism. You want to start with telling us what it is? Yeah, I'm trying to remember how much we have talked about. I know you've covered um, a little bit, and I trying to figure out where use value versus exchange value of commodities and the fetishism of the commodity sort of comes out of the contradictory nature of that and that is when you go to the store you or i go to the store we grab whiskey we'll say off the shelf and we buy a bottle of whiskey and what's that bottle of whiskey worth well it's worth you know the price tag on it because we cannot see in that bottle of whiskey who makes that whiskey, how they make that whiskey, who made the grain that went into the whiskey, how was that made. You know, we don't know if it's child labor, slave labor, cooperative labor. All we have is that it has a value. And this is hidden from us. And that hidden characteristic of it, where there's just the value in front of it, we just associate that value all of a sudden as the intrinsic thing to it and hiding that. And that's the fetishism of the commodity is that we cannot see anything in there. And we just assume this value has its own natural sort of magical characteristic to it because it starts to take on its own, own world or own world, own a life of its own. There we go. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Yeah. Like the, the fetishism is that the commodity appears there for a price seemingly by magic. Yeah. Like it's just on the shelf and we don't need to worry about where it came from. From Like it's just there. That's, that's the untruth about it, right? That's the thing that's, that's our experience is not entirely true. Yeah. Is that we experience it as this is just here. And I think it's important to highlight too, that the, value of a commodity isn't like some illusion. It actually has a value based upon the socially necessary labor time that's put into it, but that's hidden from us. It's not It's not that it's not real, it's just that it's not seen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To create that commodity, there's, yeah, the two pieces, right? There's everything that went into it that can be described in qualitative terms. You know, it was these workers with these materials working these hours, blah, blah, blah. And then there's the, the ability to boil it down to just a cold dollar value. Yeah. 40 bucks or whatever. In a way, it sort of makes sense that, I mean, there's no other way it can work for how we do things because you can't see even things that are, you know, fair trade or cooperatively. It's, tries to give you a sense but in the same token it's just sort of a label you don't yeah. you don't really know if it's fair trade okay mm -hmm. that means it's less worse than non-fair trade possibly like there are definitions for some of these things like organic has to meet a certain guideline mm -hmm. based upon whatever the usda i believe it is def or maybe it's the fda uh, there's the USDA definition, and then I think there are other ones, too. <laughs> yeah. So it's, I mean, so even attempting to sort of peek beneath the veil of this, it still doesn't exactly say everything, like locally produced versus produced somewhere else. 
okay, all you know is that it's made locally. It doesn't mean it's made any better. Yeah, know? like, was it made with underpaid farmhands that are immigrant undocumented workers or whatever? Like, that, it could still be local, but, <laughs> but not have very good labor practices. But yeah, all of those things are attempts to defetishize the commodity, right? To, to turn it just from this cold callous $40 for this product into understanding those relations. Yeah. And it's, it also, I think, in a way, feeds into the fetishism as well, because it's still attributing the social quality to the object itself as opposed to the production of the object i guess maybe not but i mean i think something like organic it it still doesn't necessarily to me say a lot about the production of it like i don't know that organic means that the workers are paid 150 percent above minimum wage Mm -hmm. you know they could be underpaid or have their wages stolen from them yeah, and it tries to tell you a little bit about the production process, but in doing so, ignores other parts of the production process. Yeah, it. In I think that's another. That's an interesting thing too. Is that organic doesn't say it. It doesn't tell you about the labor process and the production. It tells you about solely the production aspect of the production, the sans any real worker involvement. Yeah, like largely like. What it, were there chemicals used or whatever? I think that's that's a big thing in organic farming is whether or not ke- certain chemicals were used. Yeah, and even like fair trade, it doesn't necessarily say that the workers are paid this much or that they had to work, you know, twelve hours a day or six hours a day. It simply says that they were paid whatever fair prices are for. A commodity, which assumes that there's a price intrinsic to a commodity that is fair. Yeah, well, but how does that work? How does fair trade work? Because I honestly have no idea. I I do not know the definition for fair trade. I know it's supposed to be, my perception of it, I shouldn't even say that this is right, is that fair trade is you are paying someone, like I see, for coffee. It's not really produced in the United States because the only place that can grow coffee is Hawaii. Mm -hmm. So fair trade is basically paying what you would pay if it was produced in the United States, assuming then that the workers get a decent pay or something like Like, that. Like Like you're not paying, you know, 20 cents for uh, as much coffee as it took, you know, a worker a day to do, so they're not making 20 cents a day, is my perception of it. And that that's interesting that we can, I don't even know a good definition of what fair trade is because I mean that that term is just so it's a really terrible term because it doesn't <laughs> tell you anything about anything. I mean, yeah, it's making the assumption one that trade ever can be fair. You know, why is this market price? Why is a market value of something ever fair? Mm-hmm. Or how do you know it's fair? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wonder if that almost obscures more than it illuminates. I don't know. Ostensibly, there's something that I would assume the price is higher and that somehow it's a social justice thing, but I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I know if you buy, like, Starbucks coffee, which is fair trade, versus, like, Folgers, Starbucks is more expensive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But but it would be even if it weren't fair trade. Yeah, because the quality <laughs> of the answer. coffee is different. <laughs> So with commodity fetishism, going back to the larger topic, one of the things that I often see when people talk about commodity fetishism, like when it's introduced, like it, I noticed this in college classes, like when you're studying Marx and trying to understand the terms and blah, 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 the commodity fetishism comes up as a term and a concept to learn. But a lot of people go straight to the idea that it means a strong desire for a commodity and a lot of times i've seen people a lot of times people along these lines think of it as a strong desire for a commodity especially a commodity that is not necessary and i wonder if you have thoughts on that why why people go to that and and why that 
is is where people go right away when they hear the term commodity fetishism. Well, I think part of that is people conflating commodity fetishism with sexual fetishism, which in this day and age with the internet, I think is easy to do because you think of the sexual fetishism as something that you greatly desire, Mm -hmm. which... I mean, I I believe Marx is taking this from religious fetishism, which is just describing sort of magical or mystical properties to an object that does not have them. Like, you know, an idol, you worship that and it grants you its magic to do yeah, whatever idol's magic does. <laughs> yeah. Good, you know, long life or prosperity. So I, I think that's part of it. And I think the other part is, and part that, you know, I struggle a little to connect in my head is but i know is connected is this consumerist culture we live in we live in a very 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 much a consumer culture Mm -hmm. and i think maybe even this desire to consume commodities and in a way i mean if you look at uh the sort of social relations that then Marx says people attach to a product that they have a social value, you know, I get a Rolex because a Rolex is a fancy watch, and then you know I am making enough money that I can afford to spend my money. And that, you know, there's the the social quality there, the desire to accumulate, you know, if you have an empty house, people are gonna assume you don't have a lot of money, or, you know, if you have old clothes versus new nice clothes, suits, you know. Mm-hmm. I think that's part of it too. I understand. I think it's an intrinsic thing, but I don't know if I can really adequately explain how that comes together. Because I think they're very much connected, the two. Mm -hmm. But getting from A to B is a little difficult. No, I think think you've hit on the reasons why people, at least the ones that I would think of if I were trying to explain it too, the reasons why people think of that. Yeah, because like, if you hear the word fetish, by far the most common use today seems to be a sexual fetish and it, it kind of makes sense if you think of the like the original definition of the term before marx even which was the, like you said a religious fetish which was worshiping an idol rather than the god that that idol is supposed to represent so it's 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 assigning power to a thing that is rather the output of of a different thing you know, the, the idol is just a representation of the god in religious fetishism. Whereas the commodity is just the output of a whole labor process. You know, these workers do this, these workers do this, these other workers do this other thing. And at the very end, you know, via market trades, they've all produced for each other. And, and that's the social relation that is hidden by the fact that it just appears as a bottle of whiskey on on the shelf, and it's this, I think that's the same definition that you're think you know when it comes to sexual fetishism, it's the same idea that someone's assigning like a, a, a power to something that 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 object or whatever or you know whatever people are fetishizing doesn't necessarily possess. Um, but there, you know, for that person, it's a particular, you know, quote unquote power that that thing has. So I, I can see how the terms are connected, you know, and someone could, could fetishize a commodity in the sense that they've assigned a particular power to that thing that it doesn't necessarily possess. And I think that ties into, to the social status that you were talking about, right? Like yeah. assigning the power of, of status to a watch. Well, it's not the it's not really the watch that provides that status but we've via via a certain kind of fetishism you can as, assign that power to the object rather than to the actual cause of that power so why is why is understanding commodity commodity fetishism important like what how does it fit into your understanding of the world as a marxist well that where I think it really comes in as important is with money. Because money is a commodity. You know, the dollar has a value, even though it's no longer really tied to gold. I mean, when it was gold or silver, it obviously had a value. But you can invest in yen and dollars and euro. 
So it's a commodity, but the dollar or the dollar money is a very interesting commodity and in that it's the universal equivalent. The, do- the money represents pure exchange value. Yeah. Which you can exchange for any commodity. So any use value you have, you want, you can get that use value. You know, obviously you have to make an exchange and then you can switch that exchange value to use value. Mm -hmm. And if you have money, you can get any use value for any commodity because a commodity is something that is necessarily for sale. Yeah. So with, that's where it comes in is that then people switch this fetishism from just the commodity to wanting commodities, and that means they want exchange value, they want something they can switch into that, so they want money, because money gets you whatever you want as far as commodities go. Yeah, it's, in a certain way, it's the easiest commodity to fetishize, Yeah, because it, besides from exchange and storing value, which, I mean... The, the, if you d- describe the use values of money, that's the kind of stuff that you get. It, it is, you can, that you can exchange it for something else, that it can, uh, remain in this form and keep its value unlike, for example, a watermelon, which will go bad after a certain amount of time, or, or whatever. You know, a lot of commodities will go bad over time. Money, I mean, lose, it loses to inflation unfortunately, but it it's a relatively good store of value compared to other things which may go completely bad yeah. over time. Yeah, and I think it's it's one of those interesting things where if you talk to somebody, ask somebody, you know, what would make you happy, you know, what, what would you really want, a lot of people answer money. Mm-hmm. And it's a really weird thing. Like there's that uh, Bruno Mars song that was popular, I Want to Be a Billionaire. Why? What is a I mean, he's already a millionaire, you know. Mm -hmm. What is it that being a billionaire gets you that being a millionaire doesn't? (laughs) And also, I mean, for how much, you know, speaking of capitalism, the times, you know, if you go 50 years ago, somebody's thinking about wanting to be a billionaire, that just seems crazy. Because I don't know, 50 years ago, there was a billionaire. And I saw something recently, it said Bill Gates is poised to be the first trillionaire within our lifetimes. Well, within his lifetime, which is slightly less than ours i mean that's disgusting frankly to me but i really this is where i just want to sometimes go out on the street and just start asking people questions Uh what would you ask well one you know what what would make you happy what if you could have anything right now what would it be Mm -hmm. is i think the first question i think a lot of people would say money i'm hoping that wouldn't be the answer but i sort of feel like that's the answer for a million dollars or you know sure but but for a lot of those people that say money, what what does money mean to them? Because, like, if you ask them, like, even just a very simple follow-up question, like, well, what would you do with the money? Right. Then then you get straight up uh, to a commodity. Well, what do you think most people would say if you asked them, what would you spend that money on? I don't know. And see, that's what I want to know. I want to know what people would spend that money on. Mm-hmm. Why do they want to spend that money? What is it really that they're trying to get? I, I guess I also probably would go on that with the aim of being like, money isn't really what you're after. Because I assume what it would end up being is your average person would say, I want money, pay off my bills, go on vacation, you know, not have to work so hard at my job. Mm-hmm. And go, well, what you're really driving at is you want to not have to worry about food, health care, place to live, your kids, your significant others yeah you want to be able to live without worry mm-hmm. about the ne- basic necessities of life essentially what you want is you want to live in a socialist society <laughs> but you don't realize that because you just want yeah. that's not an that's not an option in their mind no exactly and that's why I, I don't know i just always feel like it would be good to go out on the street and just try and enlighten people as to that be like what you really want is this thing you just don't get that and you know not that necessarily everybody wants that Mm -hmm. but i would bet that in fact i whole part of my uh wanting to spread the word and talk to people about socialism and try and drive towards is i just fundamentally believe that the majority if not vast majority of people would be very happy under a different mode of economic production and situation yeah i mean that that's 
Yeah, of course. I mean, that's if you if you didn't believe that, you probably wouldn't be a Marxist. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I I just think that that's what I'd really like to talk to people is to find out one if I'm right, and two to point out to them if I am right that it's not actually money they want. It's the use values, not really the exchange values. And those use values are often very practical things. Mm-hmm. But then I also think you get people who just to, who want basically what capitalism drives them for, and that is accumulation for accumulation's sake. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. the, uh, the, you know, to go with the I want to be a billionaire thing. Why do you want to be a billionaire? Well, because you want more money. Why is Bill Gates a billionaire? If you or I had a billion dollars, you, what are you going to do with a billion dollars? It's just so much yeah. ludicrously large amount of money. You and I cannot comprehend what a billion is. No one can. It's an abstract thing at that point. Uh-huh. I mean, a million, we might be able to get some sort of, but a billion, that's, that's, I don't know. Yeah. You know? Like these days, a million dollars is, you know, so when you start talking in the million dollar range, that's like the one or two or three, maybe four if, if you're pretty well off. Though that many millions of dollars is like, your goal for retirement savings. Like, but when you start talking in millions, that's, that means that's your like lifetime goal is to save up that much money so that you can live for whatever three decades or however long people are going to live after they retire when we're done. Like, that is a, like, yeah, like you said, I mean, maybe it's kind of hard to comprehend, but it's like a lifetime's worth of work. Yeah. Is what I think of when we start talking about millions. Yeah. If you had a million dollars, you could re- work, retire, and live comfortably. Mm-hmm. And then when it comes to a billion dollars, well, that's a thousand of those. You're right. That that is getting to the point where it's sort of like, yeah, basically, out of the stuff that I like, I would I would feel a little bit bad if I actually lived extravagantly enough to use up that billion dollars. Like that's the time once you get hit a billion dollars, that's the time when you can I don't know, probably long before it where you can just like have that money invested somewhere, literally do nothing. Just like have a person who invests it for you. You get the returns from that and you can live off the returns sort of thing. Wow. That's like, almost jumping back to Piketty with the the wealth and you just it grows far beyond inflation. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's the drive for money that I think is so the interesting thing. And the thing that comes up with a lot of problems, because that's where I think maybe we can get to the quote now, because I think that'll fit in. I actually brought my hard copy of this. And by this, you mean capital, right? That's capital yep. volume Capital volume one. one. All right, this is in section three. It's in the chapter of the working day, which is a super, super long chapter. A lot of interesting historical stuff, and there's, we won't get into how interesting capital is. You should read or listen to capital or something. It's, it really is a, I wish we could it's get. It's like the essential work of, of Marxist economics, or like the, the seminal work at least. Yeah, and it's the one that he himself finished, so. Like the fetishism of the commodity, we were talking about this a little bit earlier before recording, but that wasn't in the first edition of Capital. It was an appendix in that, and he, in the second edition, brought it in, and then the third edition cut it down to much more interesting, which, by the way, if anyone's interested, it's chapter one, section four, which I found, I haven't actually gone through this book at all a second time, but after going through it once, rereading the section on fetishism, it was so much more clear than the first time I read it. The first time I read it, I was quite confused, but the second time, if anybody makes it through once, I... A second time will everything makes so much more sense. Anyway, no, what you have there is the second edition of Capital. Is that right? Ah, uh, I think it's the third, oh, the third. edition. Okay. Let me do 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 do. Oh no, this is the fourth edition. The fourth edition of Capital because it has the preface to the fourth edition by Engels in it. Okay, so I don't know which English and- edition this is. And it, you have the one, just in case, because sometimes people like to n- look up where where a quote is from. You've got the Penguin edition there, yes. right? The which one. is the same edition that David Harvey uses in his lectures. Okay. Which is good to know. Fourth I- edition of Capital put out by Penguin, and then why not? You can even give the page number if people really want to look it up. Yeah, it's it's in the chapter of the Working Day, which I don't know what number chapter this. 
I think it's part three of the book, page 381. And the quote is, In every stock-jobbing swindle, everyone knows that sometime or other the crash must come, but everyone hopes that it may fall on the head of his neighbor after he himself has caught the shower of gold and placed it in secure hands. Apremois la deluge is the watchword of every capitalist and of every capitalist nation. I, I really like that quote. And I did look up the stock jobbing the other day, which we were discussing how fun that is. And apparently it's a specific term referring to short term trading, like just looking for like a quick, quick buck in stock exchange. Ah, okay. Like think, a day trade would be a, a, a current day. Yeah, or the the high frequency trading. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. That's that's exactly what it is. It's you're looking to get in, make your money, and get out. Okay. But I think that the drive to get more money is what drives people to do it. They're look. Everyone's looking for a quick buck. I mean, if you, I work in a library, so I see a lot of books come through, and the amount of books that come through on how to make you know, a million dollars off your idea, or here's how to get rich in the stock market. And here's, you know, it's staggering the amount of things that come through like that. And the logical outcome of that is people do this and you get things like the housing, you get bubbles. Mm -hmm. The housing crisis is a perfect example of that. Everybody knows, all of them knew, despite whatever the government has officially said, if you watch things about this. They knew that this was not going to last with the housing crisis. Mm -hmm. And it's everybody, as soon as they saw it going bad, trying to dump it all out. And I think Deutsche Bank might have been the one that unfortunately didn't see it coming as fast as everybody else. And everybody dumped on them. And then it got AIG insured all of that. So then AIG was like, oh, we're (laughs) not going to be able to cover this. You know, Uh it's it's exactly 100% this thing and every bubble is this Mm -hmm. so i think that's where the fetishism of the commodity becomes super important is that it is one way that it really drives um some crisis formation specifically this sort of speculative bubble okay yeah i'm i'm seeing the parallel that you're drawing here because the best place for these bubbles to come up the which is the best example of the Après moi, le deluge idea is is in a bubble relies on a person focusing solely on the exchange value of something rather than the use value, and the more they can fetishize that commodity to just be a, a number on an account, the more they can convince themselves one way or the other to you know to invest in these speculative things. Speaking of which, actually, th- this reminds me of a good critique, actually, of markets. We, every once in a while, we critique markets. Th- this is a really interesting way that a market works, right? Because a market is supposed to be, like, an efficient way to allocate resources. Well, here's here's one thing that can happen in a market. When somebody buys something that they have reduced the supply and increased the demand, right? They've bought their item and so they have reduced the supply of that and if you know everything else remaining constant the price of that thing will increase if they've bought up a bunch of it because there's less supply they've created or you can say they've created more demand however you want to look at it and that will discourage other people from buying that thing because the price has gone up with speculation it's the opposite they buy that thing which causes the price to go up because they've increased demand for it, which causes other people to say, oh, hey, the price of that thing is going up. I should buy it too. It actually works in the opposite way than would be good for, you know, like if if you think about it from just I'm buying this commodity because I want its use value, then that market kind, kind of works to a certain extent. At least it does does what it's supposed to do in this example. But from a speculative point of view, it actually, you know, it's it snowballs. It it actually makes it more of an investment. And so if people buy it just because it's an investment, then that encourages more of that kind of buying. Um, have you seen the movie Trading Spaces with Dan Aykroyd and Eddie Murphy? No. That is, uh, I don't want to spoil the movie for anybody. You should see it, but... The conclusion to the movie is 
them harnessing this opera mod la deluge exactly like you were just describing. Okay. For their own benefit. It's, yeah. Yeah. Or trading places. Did I say trading spaces? I think it was a TV show. Either way, it's trading places. I don't Whatever know. I said. <laughs> this also makes me think a little bit about the environment. Because mm. part of this consumption or accumulation for accumulation's sake, who cares, let it fall on everybody else's health, is the disregard, basically, for the consequences of that. Mm hmm. And environmental degradation due to industry and pollution, I think, is just 100% all over that. Yeah. It's that it, no one cares that fracking is putting gas and poison into people's water and causing earthquakes because the United States can capitalize on that and sell that to a European market. Well, it's not that nobody cares. Well, okay. It's that the people who get to make the decisions right. don't care. Yes, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Because they're the ones that are benefiting from it. Yeah. That, that and get the revenues from it, but don't have to deal with their water being able to be lit on fire. Right. Although, interestingly, I believe it's one of the VPs or somebody high up, maybe even the CEO of, like, Texaco, was suing... A different company fracking to keep them away from their, you know, twenty million dollar ranch out somewhere, where they were going to be doing fracking around there. Even though his company does it all over the place, once it came close to his house, yeah, he then was interested in making sure other companies didn't do it nearby. Yeah, because he has the clout to challenge that, unlike most people. Yeah, I think that very much ties into. The the opera moi, la delusion, the fetishism of the commodity, specifically of the fetishism of the money commodity. Mm -hmm. It's people will do anything. I mean, look at uh, banana republics. People will literally murder yeah. to make money. Mm -hmm. I mean, companies, not that all companies are, are okay with that, but there are companies out there that are okay murdering a uh, British East India company. Mm -hmm. I mean, they subjugated an entire nation simply to just make profit. It's, yeah. you know, the, the, the drive for profit is crazy and people take that fetishism to the extreme. Well, and the, you know, the someone who supports capitalism, right, is going to look at that and say, yes, but not everyone does that, right? Like, Capitalism is a good system because not everyone does that and, and eventually those people will get their comeuppance or, or whatever. But I think my look at it, or at least my take on it from a Marxist perspective is, this is ridiculous if we have an incentive to do that. Right? Like, but there are times when, when maybe capitalism does a good thing. Like, it would be ridiculous. It, like, obviously, a social system must do something good every once in a while. Otherwise, it will be disposed of very quickly. So, so capitalism will do positive things from time to time. However, it, it's a fundamental flaw in an economic system that says, if you are willing to do this awful thing, you can make more money. And whether that thing is killing people or polluting or just paying lower wages than, than you could afford. You know, if you pay, you could afford to pay your workers $12 an hour, but instead you pay them 8 Well, what you get is you get to control, you know, you get to either reinvest that money in your company to make it larger or pay it out to yourself as a dividend or whatever. You get social power by doing an awful thing. And that's the system that we have. We have one that says, if you're willing to do something awful, then there's a good chance you can make money doing that. Yeah. And I think the extreme, extreme right wing, zero government libertarianism, I don't think realizes that necessarily that that is the sort of thing that they would create. Because um, I often like to think of the drug trade, the illegal drug trade, mm. is basically the logical conclusion of far right-wing libertarianism. They're, it's pure market-based. They completely disregard all laws and governments, because otherwise they wouldn't be able to function. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, you get a very bloody, violent thing, because if you don't like your competitor, would you just kill them, If yep. unless you can't, in which case... Then their competition, you literally fight over the market. It's yeah. 
And I mean, I think that is, if you, there isn't a government intervention, which I know most people on the right don't like government intervention, but they like government intervention when it means they're not being murdered for a market, you know. <laughs> right. Yes. I think, I don't think there are many, even people in the libertarian movement who really would be okay with basically a drug cartel running the country. Mm-hmm. But I, I don't think that people realize that as far as I can see, drug cartels and whatnot are pure capitalism. Yeah, the the logic of the unregulated market. Yeah, it's you do anything and everything to expand your market and make your profit. Yeah. Which is disturbing and crazy. Yeah. This episode is part of the Marxism Today podcast series. Marxism Today is recorded, mixed, edited, produced, and maintained by Tony Schmidt and Red Wagner. It is distributed freely and licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 license. To find out more about the Marxism Today podcast, visit our website at marxismtodaypodcast.wordpress.com, where you can find archives of all of our episodes available for download. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.